This is Jonathan Lane from Fan Film Factor with my uh, goatee now. I've shaved the uh, extra stuff over here. This is going to stay for a bit. Uh, I am also here with the movers and shakers of Dreadnought Dominion. Uh, starting off on the top there is Gary Davis, who plays the captain of the USS Dominion. Uh, captain uh, Rousseau. Rousseau. <laughs> Rousseau. Not Broussard. I Not started Broussard. this before. I, I I had to restart this thing because I called him Broussard, and 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 I was like, okay, I restarted. And I said, like, actually, we have an ongoing gag. One one of the adversaries calls you Broussard all the time. Right. Uh, so like, John Big Boutay, Tay, Tay. Um, <laughs> anyway, below Gary, we have David Randy Ren. We call him Randy, and he plays Commander. Are you Captain? Denson now? Captain Denson. Got, you got promoted. That's right. Chief Engineer and First Officer of the Dominion. And a special guest tonight, because I'm always interviewing these guys, but I've never had a chance to talk to the lovely and elegant Miss Victoria Athlon. So welcome to Fan Film Factor for the first time, Victoria, and welcome back, you guys. So I did watch your most recent Dreadnought Dominion film, which was called uh, The More Things Change. And honestly, I think that was your best work yet. I want to applaud you. And one of the reasons that Victoria is here is because this is an episode with a lot of meaty parts to it. Uh, I mean, usually, you know, you see the, the main people, they get most of the lines, most of the stuff to do. And, you know, occasionally people come and give a line here and there but this was really an ensemble episode and, and very well executed and some of the best scenes were given to victoria so i, I was like hey let's have victoria on and she agreed and so we're going to start with you victoria how about that okay <laughs> i enjoyed seeing that episode randy's a great storyteller he really is. I, I have to say, I do enjoy every time a new Dreadnought Dominion comes out. I always look forward to seeing it, and not just because you know the sets are really nice. Those are the Kingsland sets that were used for Star Trek Continues and Starship Farragut. You know, but I you know, guys just yeah. Oh, you did that. You know what? Let's let's start the Victoria bio part of this because I know that you have been involved in fan films. Uh, I think since like the Starship Farragut days, they were like two or three episodes that you were part of right yes um i started with farragut in 2012 and um i was in uh conspiracy of innocence um the crossing and homecoming and you were their uh, transporter chief i think dupree was, yeah. was that uh, and um did you write uh one of the episodes too no not for farragut um i did write some of the um uh, of the written material that we used in Conspiracy of Innocence. Um, but I, did, I didn't write any episodes. My writing credits are all uh, through um, a different production. I work with Randy Landers. And That's I've true. probably written 14 or 15 Demos episodes. That's true, because in addition to being a regular on Dreadnought Dominion and having appeared uh, in Starship Farragut, you are also not only a regular, but you are now the captain of the Starship Deimos coming out of Potemkin Pictures, now located in Lexington, Kentucky. Where where are you located, Victoria, by the way? I don't know where you live. I'm in Central Florida. Um, okay. And by the way, Gary, you are in Ohio, right? And yeah, uh, Central Ohio, Columbus. Central Ohio. <laughs> Uh, and 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 Randy, are you in Central North Carolina or? Oh no, darn it! No, no, no! I had to be this the oddball. No, I'm in South, the Southern point of uh, North Carolina, Charlotte, or near Charlotte. Oh, near Charlotte. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. This is uh, Fan Film Factor Geography for 100, Alex. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, all righty. Anyway, back to Victoria. So you do a lot of traveling for your fan films then because you were doing, you were doing Deimos regularly while it was still in Alabama. And now you're driving a couple of states even further north. Are you driving or are you flying when you, when you go and do um, Deimos? Typically I drive. 
um, when we were still in Pelham, uh, we were filming about once a quarter. Now it's about twice a year um, because the majority of the cast are coming from various locations in Alabama. Uh, I'm probably the farthest out. It's about a 15 or 16 hour drive for me. Um, but it's worth it. Um, I mean, I do these things for the friends I've made the, and, and the people that I've met while doing them. Um, Dominion, we do about once a year. And um, un unless the guys have something special planned where, where they need us. And if I get enough notice and can plug it into my my calendar, my real world calendar tends to <laughs> back up uh, fairly far down the road. But if I can get notice, I'll, I'll plug it in. And, uh, and if I can be there, I will, um, because all of these people are friends. Uh, uh, the three groups that I work with now, um, the people that are, uh, I work with in them, I've, they've all been friends for years. And, uh, and I just enjoy every chance I get to go and hang out with my friends. You've got fan films in your blood. Oh, by the way, if anybody's kind of wondering, this is not the, sh the shirt I'm wearing. This is this is not like some cool 3D thing or whatever, uh, or, 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 or uh, green screen thing. This is the actual shirt. Um, I just got it today. I was wanting to see how it would look on them. Um, on camera and it's kind of weird of this part but anyway it's a cool shirt I like it. um so uh anyway so victoria what do you do for your day job when you're not making fan films i'm an attorney you're an attorney well that's yeah. cool what kind of an attorney i don't normally i don't normally let this out but i'm an assistant state attorney in Central Florida. I'm a state prosecutor and have been one for 21 years. I was that a probation cool. officer before that and wow. uh, in the military before that. Before that, See, I was this, a paramedic in DC. This is why I wanted Victoria on. You know, I mean, I see her on fan films. I had no idea all the other stuff. So that is it. So you were in the, what, what branch of the military were you in? U.S. Army. I was military police. Airborne mm -hmm. military police, in fact. <laughs> so, so when you were chasing people, you jumped out of an airplane to catch them? <laughs> well, it, that's kind of a, of a, of a misconception. Um, the military police corps in the Army, at the time that I was in, it was the only, uh, it, was a, it, it was about as close to combat arms as women could get. And we, um, our combat support, uh, provide law enforcement support and uh, secure supply routes, that kind of thing. Um, so it's not unusual. Uh, when I served, I was on Fort Bragg and um, we were part of the, uh, of the 18th Airborne Corps. And our battalion, mostly was tasked with, uh, with law enforcement support working behind uh, forward deployed units, um, primarily the 82nd Airborne Division um, or, or the 101st out of uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, I've been out of the country a couple of times doing that kind of thing. I was in Panama. Um, I've been in Honduras. Um, I was on the security detail for the, uh, the general at one point, and this is 1987, 1988. Um, so I traveled a little bit with, uh, with him, uh, with his detail. Uh, I, was in, I was an enlisted soldier at the time, obviously. Um, so MPs are kind of Jackson, or, or Jackson Jills of all trades. Um, my military career was <laughs> thoroughly undistinguished. Um, I was only in for two years. And, and, um, Still a lot of stuff to do in two years. I, I, I mean, Gary, Randy, can you, can you beat any of that? I was in 22 years. <laughs> you, were in, you were in 22 years? Yeah, I was in the Navy for 22 years. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Randy, were you, in, were, were you in any? 
I was 4F when I went for my physical. Oh, okay. Yeah, they didn't want me either. Uh, okay, so Gary and, and Victoria, you guys win the Semper Fi Award of uh, Marine. Uh, but you know, it was, it was just veterans day yesterday. We're recording this on the 12th. So, uh, you know, happy, happy veterans day one, uh, one day late, but thank you both for your service. Uh, just want to put that in there. All right. So back to star Trek fan films. And of course the Victoria are, uh, the <laughs> Victoria Avalon, um, biography, by the way, it here, here's an interesting thing. Uh, Victoria Avalon. That is, is that your is, is that your original name or is that like a stage name that you use? That's my married name. That's um, your married name. Okay. I, I took my husband's name when uh, when I got married. My maiden name is Phillips. Oh, okay. And your husband last name because Avalon's a cool name, by the way. Is is is, is he from Britain? Well, I think that if I remember correctly, he is somehow distantly related to. Frankie Avalon, and um, they're <laughs> they're Italian, and they sh the one of the ancestors shortened their shortened the name when they came over. Well, I was probably like Avalone. I or could something. be wrong about that. I never, I never, I've never really asked him. Um, <laughs> that name also has English roots. Um, there's a uh, there's an island, I think. Um, so it could have come from that. Um, I. Honestly, yeah, we've been married yeah. 25 years and I never ask. Oh, it's a good sign of a good marriage. You don't talk to yourself. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, because I, I was going to say that there is another fan series that I'm sure most fans of Fan Film Factor are aware of, and that's the Avalon Universe. And they have two Victorias. They started with Victoria Fox. Uh, she's no longer with them. Uh, they now have Victoria Archer. She is the very thin blonde engineer who hangs out with Captain Derek Mason. And the only Victoria they don't seem to have is the one that would be most appropriate for, for the Avalon universe, which is Victoria Avalon. But you don't, you don't do Avalon. Uh, I, would you like I to do Avalon? I'm quite connected with, uh, with that production. Although if I was asked, I would. Um, Joshua Irwin is a friend of mine, although internet friend. We, I don't think we've ever really met in real life. But he's a he's a very accomplished cinematographer, and I agree, 100%. Uh, that's a particular form of artistry that that I appreciate um, quite a bit. And uh, and I like, I, I mean, I like their work. Their work is fantastic. And and uh, if I was asked, I would uh, uh, I would almost certainly try to make time. Okay, so Josh, you hear that? We got to get Victoria Avalon to the Avalon universe so that you can become the I wouldn't say the Where's Waldo, sort of the Where's Wilma of, of Star Trek fan films, but just add another fan series for you. Uh, so one more question for Victoria before we get back to Dreadnought Dominion and, and you know these other guys here. Do you have professional or not professional even, but just you know acting training uh, at all, or are you just you go with it? I have had no training whatsoever, but. All trial lawyers are ham actors first, and uh. <laughs> if they say otherwise, they're lying. Um, I've done 75 jury trials in 21 years. Um, a lot, a lot more um, appellate and post-conviction work. I'm a, primarily an appellate attorney, but all prosecutors are. Well, I hate to say it this way because it sounds so military, but we're all riflemen first, right? And uh, <laughs> you can't work for a prosecutor's office without being able to try cases. And I've tried my share um, from misdemeanors all the way up to capital homicides, in fact. And um, when you're speaking to a jury, one of the things you've got to be able to do is tell a story. And while I am not the caliber of storyteller that Randy is, Randy Wren, um, I can hold my own. And um, I'm not afraid of public speaking. You, you can't survive long as a trial lawyer if you are. And uh, that is, is what I draw on, um, on that experience of, of having to stand in the courtroom well and, and tell a story to the jury of total strangers. Um, but I have had no formal training whatsoever. 
Well, I have to say it, 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 it's very impressive, though, uh, that you've had no formal training and, and you still manage to do what you do on on the fan series. You know, I mean, I, you know, I, I love your character on Starship Deimos and that's uh, Captain um, Gabriel. Gabriel, that's right. You started as an engineer, too. Everybody starts you off as an engineer and that you promoted, although you're a medical officer on, on Dominion. So actually, it's not true. Uh, but um, but you have an accent. I was going to ask where you were from, because, you know, you have this kind of accent when you do your Captain Gabriel on uh, Deimos. But that accent is gone right now. So. You know, looking at it, I'm reminded of a story I heard once in a religious service. You're from uh, England and on Earth, right? Anglican Church? Indeed. It was the story of Leviathan. Thomas Aquinas thought of it as a demon that consumed the damned at the Last Judgment. You don't suppose that this is our Leviathan, do you, Adam? <laughs> well, and that's kind of funny. Um, Gabriel is English, and uh, we work very hard to get that accent. I have friends from, from Southern England um, and, and Gabriel is, is from South London. And um, her father, in fact, is, is Welsh, which is where the, the name comes from. And um, the funny, I, I guess I did pretty good with it because um, I was on another show, Roger Noriega interviewed me and it freaked them all out when I showed up and this is what I sound like. You know, this is really what I sound like. <laughs> because it, it seems like um, a lot of people thought that I was actually English. And, uh, and I, guess, I guess that's, um, that's um, it's very flattering. I'm not, but ancestry wise, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm about as uh, uh, British Isles as it's possible to be, um, seven eighth of my ancestry is uh, from Ireland, England, or uh, Wales. So, um, and then there's one branch of the family that's uh, from Saxony and Germany. Um, so I guess I come by it honestly. <laughs> um, Dr. Farrell, on the other hand, is from West Virginia, which is where I'm originally from. And uh, when I started playing that character that originally came about in, in 2015, when Randy and, and Gary were doing an animated production um, called Excalibur Logs. And um, it, if you haven't seen it, you should see it. Um, they worked so hard on, on, this, on this animation and um, the premise of it was the uh, is that the entire senior staff um, of this starship are all women, and um, they asked me to voice because it's animated. They asked me to voice Dr. Farrell, who apparently has been a, a character in their uh, universe and their canon for many years. So that was a signal honor. I, I was honored to be asked to do that, um, and when. I was asked to do that. They asked me to uh, to be like a, a Dr. McCoy, a country doctor, an old country doctor. And so um, I'm Appalachian by extraction, and uh, you can probably hear it in my voice now. Um, I just amp it up a little bit, you know. And, and she's she's a a lot more uh, irascible, I guess, than than I am. Um, that goes with the character, I guess. Here, I'll help. The engines can wait, Nichols. You need to tend to yourself. Y'all young people don't know how to handle your liquor. She's kind of a technology Luddite. One of the things that, that strangely enough, no one has noticed is that she wears an analog wristwatch, and it's mine, and, uh, and that's by design. I mean, she believes in hands-on and, and touch, and, and you know she, she'll take manual pulse and respiration which I do the same way I did when I was in EMT in DC back in the 1980s. And uh, strangely enough, no one has, has, has gigged us on that yet. You know, <laughs> we, they didn't have watches back then. That, that's Star Trek, we don't have that. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, 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 they do. <laughs> and uh, and that, that's kind of kind of one of her things. And, and the, the guys let me get away with that. And, and that's, that's actually been a lot of fun creating that character. When these doors open, 
you're going to see some things that are going to be very difficult for you to process. Just remember that everything that you're going to see is normal for this place and for this time. You're not in any danger, okay? It sounds like, Victoria, that you, you do a lot with your characters to create their backstory. Do you do that with the people who write the episodes, or is that pretty much just you saying, okay, this is who my character is and who she's, where she's from and what she likes to do? You know, How much of that is with the writers and how much of that is just you just telling the writers, this is it? It depends on which, um, on which production you're talking about. Um, with Demos, I've written the majority of those episodes. Um, Gabriel's backstory is mostly my creation because the character is mostly my creation. Um, although I've worked with Randy Landers um, very closely on all of that. Um, Randy is a very another very gifted storyteller. Um, he, he's the other Randy that, that I work with. There's too many Randys out there. Too many Victorias. Too many more names. With, uh, with Dr. Farrell, um, I collaborated with uh, Randy Wren and Gary um, on creating her because so much of, of her backstory was already in place. Um, her having been a, a longtime member of, of, their, of their universe. And so um, being asked to bring a character like that to life is, is, is a tremendous, uh, is a gift. And a, and a tremendous honor. I'm, I'm just thrilled to have had that opportunity. Yeah, I wrote Doc Farrell when I was in middle school. Yeah. So you know, I created all these characters for Excalibur when I was, I guess I was in middle school and high school and, and continued often when I was in the military. So Doc Farrell has been a member of, you know, of, of my crew for, for forever and ever. So when she got it, she's like, Yes, you nailed it. You brought you brought Maureen to life. So, uh, you know, whenever, you know, the, the very first episode that we had with her, you know, she just knocked my socks off. Yeah, she, she does an amazing job. And I think and this this most recent episode, which we'll talk about, I swear we're about to talk about the most recent episode. Uh, <laughs> well, it just uh, makes but, sense. When, when we did that, uh, the general idea was is that she's been transferred from the Excalibur to uh, to the Dominion. Um, because she and, and Bruso are, are old, old friends and she's come to, to fill in for Tamara since Tamara has gotten married and she's gone. And um, it just, we just kind of uh, have fallen into this, this brother sister kind of vibe. And, and it's really, it works. I mean, it was just, it just happened that way. We really didn't plan it. No. Oh, it just, it, it really, it felt wonderful. I mean, because, you know, obviously in Star Trek, you always want the doctor to have some kind of a personality. Oh. Uh, <laughs> pardon me. And the more curmudgeoning, I guess, the better. <laughs> uh, you know, so you, you really, you really bring that, uh, that to the forefront. Okay, so let's talk about this episode. Uh, once again, the, the title uh, was The More Things Change. And this was... I would, I would dare say I'd call it a big episode. And obviously the, the runtime was within the half an hour, you know, plus or minus the, the guidelines allow, but you had a lot of actors and characters and, and people with lines, you know, not just, you know, background people in, in uniforms. So talk a little bit, whichever one of you is in charge of it, of getting everybody there to South Georgia, Southeastern Georgia and Kingsland. I'm guessing over a weekend, over two weekends. I mean, how long does it take you to film an episode like that? It was four days. Thursday, Plus we, Thursday Friday, and Saturday. And maybe Friday, a little, Friday, 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 Friday. No, no, no. Yeah, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then Sunday, Saturday, and Sunday. Part of Saturday and Sunday was uh, passenger with baggage. Yeah, it was a twofer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as long as you had everybody there, you might as well. Yeah, and as for those that don't know, uh, The Passenger with Baggage was the previous Dominion release where Frank Parker Jr., whom I interviewed a couple weeks ago, came back. He was the original captain of the Dominion, Commodore, actually, uh, Sam Grissom, and he left the series. And so he came back for a visit because he kind of left abruptly, <laughs> leaving the keys with, uh, with, with Gary and Randy. Uh, <laughs> 
But in addition to Frank, the person making his peace with you is also a chance for, for Sam Grissom to make his peace with Rousseau and, and Benson and all the other folks on the Dominion who was like, hey, what, what the heck happened? Why did you leave all of a sudden? So anyway, so you filmed that at the same time. And you, did, and you just did that on Sunday, right? Because that was a pretty quick episode, right? Well, we, we, we did Thursday, Friday, Saturday, part of Saturday and Sunday. That's how it worked. So on Saturday, when we were filming a transporter scene with the more things change, then we would say, okay, that cast leave other cast for the passengers come in. And then we would do oh. the transporter scenes for the passengers. So, you know, normally when we film, we don't film it in order of the scenes. We're always jumping around. Well, we had two scripts. So we're doing scene eight from the more things change and, and scene three from the passengers. So yeah, if it wasn't for that guy right there, nobody would keep it straight. I mean, the man is amazing. And you, you were asking who's responsible for bringing all these people here. He's our chief cat herder and he does right. an awesome, awesome job. And I don't know how he finds these talented, talented people that it, it, we just keep having a regular, you know, in addition to the, to the regulars here, but a regular guest occurrence of people that just, just blow me away. So I'm not sure what he's doing. You know, if he has a magical reel or a- Well, share, share with the group, you know, what's uh, what do you do to find it? Like, for example, you had, you know, had two brand new actors I hadn't seen before in any fan film. They're, you know, both, both playing the Russians, the, the female, Russian crew member and the Russian that you uh, uh, were they actually people of Russian descent with Russian real yes. Russian accents or we, they were big honest to goodness Russians we had uh, uh, Vlad uh, Gleb uh, he and Vlad's not his full name it's like Vlad or Nanov or something uh, he uh, he was the main one the one that lived and the Russian cosmonaut that died on the table <clears throat> his name was Sergei Yuzinov and uh uh, unfortunately, he never got to show his Russianness because he died, you know, before he before he came on. He died uh, in Russian. Yeah, he died in Russian. Had <laughs> a Russian death. Yes. And, 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 and when when uh, Vlad first wakes up, you know, and he and he, and he looks at uh, uh, Dara, who's standing at the, uh, beside the bed, and he said, uh, and he says, uh, "Where am I? Who are you?" Uh, yeah, you know, he said that in Russian. And, uh, and nobody had to look it up for him or anything. Dear, who are you? Please, stay calm. You, you are Russian? Yes, I'm Russian, but... Did I, did I press button? Did I cancel? I'm sure you did, Mr. Bogmatov. No, you do not understand. Must cancel. All will be lost. Must cancel. That's one of the reasons that I had asked is, is you know, the, the, the brief part, part where they're speaking in Russian was so, I mean, not that I speak Russian beyond, you know, spasiva, uh, but, you know, it was like, it just, it, it was so smooth. I was just like, okay, you got an actual Russian. Yeah. Uh, and apparently you, you did. And, and was the actress also Russian? No, but okay. uh, she, I, our um, chief, chief of science, <laughs> I got mixed up on this the other day. What do you call her? What do you call science her? Science officer. Science yeah, officer, our chief science officer, I work chief in there, uh, <laughs> Tracy Frank. She uh, is an awesome actress, and she's got a huge part in a uh, Hulu series uh, that uh, she just did an episode of. And she is ready for prime time. We're going to lose her any second to Hollywood. I just know it. it makes me sad. <laughs> but uh, she. Uh, I went to her and I said, do you know anybody that speaks uh, with a good Russian accent? And she said, well, I have a friend who just was nominated for a, a, a leading actress award. And she was doing a Russian accent in that. And so she got me in contact with, uh, with Dara. And, uh, and she said, yes, I'll do it. Because she's, you know, she's friends with uh, Tracy. So she, you know, they, they rode down together you know, it was, it was great. They were like pals, you know, road trip pals. And uh, Tracy as in Mrs. Gary Davis? No, Tra Tracy? no other, other Tracy. Tracy. Oh, okay. Uh, our science officer. Oh, your science officer, Tracy. Tracy okay. plays Piper. She's oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, she is an awesome actor. And, okay, and, so the Victorias and and you know and Tracys and just yeah. all these. Just, we need more names, guys. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Cast people with different names. We have Vleb. I mean, wow, <laughs> Vleb. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and and uh, Sergey, who everybody calls him Serge, um, because that's what it sounds like. It looks like it sounds like, but it's but, yeah, it's a Russian name, Sergey. Sergey. Yeah, that's what I call him. Sergey. Ah. All his friends call him Serge. Anyway, uh, he I go to a, a monthly meeting called the uh, Carolina Film Community, and they just get together once a month on the second Tuesday of every month, first Tuesday, it doesn't matter, <laughs> and uh, they uh, watch films that everybody's made. Uh, you know, there the, are our, our people. If anybody's made a film, they bring it in, and uh, then they uh, just have a speaker and uh, and then socialize. It's it's, it's great. But the thing is, while you're there, you get to network and you get to meet uh, actors and producers and directors and camera people, you know, it's crew people. Any, anything you think of, there's somebody there that does it and somebody there that's looking for something to do. And uh, so I, I've met people and met people through those people. And, uh, you know, you know I, I put the feelers out, you know, you know, who can we get for this upcoming episode? And, and we get people like that leading lady from uh we are many who is you know we're just blessed that's excellent too yeah that yeah, another yeah. episode uh that you guys should go back and watch your captain's scene already we are many was mm-hmm. your best episode until this episode in the face like a dozen times that was i know i <laughs> i really hurt from my art eight eight i counted them <laughs> Eight we, did, in the face. we had the two looking from Gary's point of view and her point of view, and then uh, a two for you know with both of them in the shot, and we did two or three takes of each one, and each one she smacked me. But I, I told it gave Gary the motivation to say you only get one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I, t- I told Gary before we did it. I said, "Look, uh, I think it would be really, really best if she actually did make contact." You know, I mean, sure, it's smack you hard, of course, but but. Yeah, you, you get that sound that you're just not going to get right. It's that you can't sorry. sell it. <laughs> so I, you know, so I said, I tell you what, every time that was, she that was his it, reason, was, Gary. That's what he told you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I said every time, every time I, as she smacks you, I let her smack. You. How's that? But it didn't work out that way. But she, did, she practiced on me before she went. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But you know, you never forget your first contact, your second that's contact, right. your third contact, <laughs> your fourth contact. Enough already! <laughs> Look, I'm Captain Kirk. Uh, uh, <laughs> That's, uh, right. That's right. He slapped himself. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, everything triggers Star Trek. You know, it's like no matter what yes. you're doing in any particular time, something will trigger Star Trek during your day, and you just like exactly. go to it. Uh, all right, so you you then have to get all these people to make sure that they can get enough days off to film everything. So at that point, Randy, you're hurting the cats. You make a lot of phone calls. How do you make sure that they show up when you just like, don't cancel out of me, don't not show up? I ride them like, <laughs> like a, like a, uh, a, a really- Oh, get a good metaphor here. Yeah, no, I've got to be careful on what metaphor I use. I ride them like a Harley Davidson. How about yeah, there that? You go. <laughs> I ride them hard. Now, well, I, I, I try not to be a nuisance, but I, but every week or two they get a nice little friendly reminder. Uh, it's coming up. It's not very long. You know, everything going good, you know. And uh, and then we just hope for the best. We've had pretty good luck. Uh, yeah. With with people showing up, and uh, you know, there's always that possibility. I mean, that somebody could have a car trouble the way down. We had <laughs> our DP show up. Director of photography, by the way, for those who don't know, your DP. Yeah hours late was it it was at least three hours late on uh, yeah. technical difficulties yeah technical uh, difficulties technical difficulties had technical difficulties for your dp that's yeah. right yeah but by, by, by the way not you know filming without a dp is kind of like you know going into an, an uber <laughs> without a driver that's right uh, <laughs> you, I mean, you could drive the car yourself but things would go horribly wrong <laughs> he's a, va- a bank vice president so he has a, a really very big important job with you know where he's got you know he's a lot of responsibility 
and he had something come up just as he was getting ready to leave his house to drive down there. And he had to go somewhere and do something and come back. And I, I think he was on the road. And he had to turn around and go back home and do something and then start again. And, and we were down there. We had, you know, we had a live audience. I mean, it wasn't much. It was like 10 people. But uh, they, they were sitting there and they were very patient, very, I, bless their hearts. They, they sat there for a long time waiting for our DP to show up and start filming. And I was over there like, you know, I, I was that close to doing a stand-up routine. I was doing tap dances. Like, I was, I, you know, we were we were rehearsing and blocking shots and stuff. And I would tell them, oh, okay, now this is the 180 rule. We, we got to make sure we use the 180 rule and don't go to the other side of the actors in the middle of a scene. And, you know, just giving them behind the scenes information or something just to keep them engaged, you know, somehow or another until he showed up. But, but. And uh, we had somebody uh, in February, no, January, uh, not show. And he, and he let us know after we were down there, uh, uh, like the night before we were going to shoot. But it just so happened that we had to reshoot what we shot in January and February. And then he was able to come back then and do his stuff that he was supposed to have done in January. <laughs> so it worked. Anyway, we have some close calls like that, but generally we have really good luck. Yeah, and, and you know, when you watch a Star Trek fan film, the more people that you see in it, the harder it was to make. No matter how easy the fan film looks to make, the more people in the credits, the more difficult it is because you really have to have everybody rowing in the same direction, you know, and they all have to be in the boat at the same time. And sometimes when a whole bunch of people aren't in the boat, the boat will not move. Whereas you can row a boat with less than all the proper number of rowers, but there's a key person missing. You know, that happens sometimes, like with your director of photography. It's like sometimes if somebody doesn't show up and they're just an extra or whatever, you can get by without them and you'll just, you know, grab somebody else. But you need your actors there and you need your lighting people there and you need your sound people there. And there's so much stuff. So when you watch an episode like you just watched, hopefully at the beginning of this blog, you know, just really appreciate all the care that went into that from building the sets to getting the costumes ready. I mean, your costumes fit your actors for the most part. Do you do alterations of the costumes based on the actor sizes or did each actor have their own costume or, yeah. you know, what, what do you do? Each actor has their own costume. That's one of the, the, the policies I have with Dreadnought Dominion is I can't pay people to come down. I can't pay for their gas or their lodging. So I buy them their uniform and they get to keep it. And uh, it's it's it, it just it fills my heart with joy when they try on their uniform and I, we don't do alterations. They put it on and it just fits. You know, when Victoria put her chief medical officer smock, I was like, please fit, please fit. And it was like <laughs> it was it was made to be. But I love looking at them and I go, it looks great. You can keep that. And when they look at me, they go, really? And it just <laughs> makes me it makes me feel really good. So I, I love putting all the uniforms together, uh, you know, months in advance and taking it down. When I made the, uh, the, the cosmonaut uniforms and the two cosmonaut Russian guys, and I go, and you can keep those. Their, their faces just lit up. And I go, I know what to wear them for Halloween now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So once you have all of your footage in the camp, and I ask this, you know, pretty much of, of everybody, but, you know, post-production starts. Who is in charge of your post-production? I, I start it off. You I, go get. I, I bring, I get the first, I get the files and I rename them with, with names that actually mean something. So that when you look at the file, you know, you have an idea of what it is. And uh, once I get the files renamed, I do the very first rough draft of the, uh, you know, put it all together. <clears throat> and after that, well, while I'm doing the rough draft, I'm sending Gary the renamed files. And, uh, and then we share them over Dropbox. And uh, we, when, when we, well, like if I'm editing scene one, I edit it, I save it. And I say, you know, and I say, Gary, I'm in scene one. And uh, when I, all right, Gary, I'm out of scene one. And uh, it syncs up to Dropbox. And then I'll do that during the day because Gary works during the day and I'm retired. At five o'clock when Gary comes home from work, 
you know, he can check a Facebook messenger and say, oh, he sees where I'm out at now, and he can go in and he can start editing. And uh, once we get several scenes, I can be on scene one and two, and he can be on scene three and four. We keep them in separate files, a couple of scenes in each file. And uh, that way we can both be editing at the same time, just not in the same scene. Now, you've got a lot of complex stuff. You know, Dominion, you know, has visual effects. You've got green screen stuff to composite. I know that Sam Cockings does your VFX stuff. I'm guessing he makes animatics for you and you put those in. And I guess, well, the first question I guess is, is how long before you start editing your episode do you get Sam started on your VFX shots? It, it varies. I mean, they're, they're, when we shot um, uh, uh, the pilot for um, Project Runabout, um, he had all the roughs for every scene ready before I had my actress even get on set. So it was great that I had the roughs. So I set up a, a, a 32 inch television in front of the cockpit of the runabout. So she was able to see what was going to be in the final episode. So we had all the roughs for everything for that episode before we started, but other times it's, we shoot it, and we just have a nebulous idea of what we want the uh, the CGI to be, and then Randy leaves that up to me because uh, you know he writes it. But it's it's well, we both have the same kind of people. I don't know what I'm talking about, but we make a list and we tell we tell Sam this is what we want it to look like. What, what what's exciting to me is is half the time they don't even sh- turn out the way that we envisualize it. You know, Sam goes, "What do you think?" I'm like, "Wow." <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so it's almost better that it works out that way. You know, we we waited what like two three months for uh, the more things change because mm-hmm. uh, you know he jumped us ahead for Project Runabout, and then he did you know Passenger with Baggage, and he says you have to wait for your other one. We go okay since you gave us two, but it was worth uh, every it. yeah every everybody is just happy these days. He yeah. did stuff, yeah, uh, and he does stuff for for Avalon Universe, and he did stuff for for Yorktown, and he's got his own stuff he's doing. He does stuff for yeah. uh Yeah, I, I, I always come up with a different nickname for Sam. Every you know, if, for anybody who goes through my blogs, anytime I mention Sam Cockings, there's always a different nickname for him. Just read through the blogs, and if you see Sam Cockings, there will always be a different nickname. And since Dune just came out, um, I'll use the nickname today. The Kitsat Satarak of fan film uh, visual <laughs> effects, you know, who can be in all places at, at one time. Uh, that's right. <laughs> that's what he does. But, Love it. And I also know from Josh Irwin of how much it can be nerve wracking to be waiting for a shot from, from Sam. You know, Josh is very meticulous about his deadlines or whatever and you know sam's like you'll have it you'll have it and um you know biting your fingernails is you know you're waiting for stuff at the last minute but he, he comes through he gets the stuff done and, and, and yes. it's amazing he can do the quality that he does and do as many things as he does uh, never so. disappointed in what what he sends us and it's yeah. it's randy and i it's like a kid at christmas time you know he says with the we transfers coming over and i'm downloading it downloading it unpacking unpacking and then it's it's just like unwrapping a Christmas present. It's awesome. It is for him too. Yeah. I, it's, <laughs> it's so strange. He's well, I kind of get it because I'm proud of what we do, and he's proud of what he does, and so he he wants our reaction right now. And uh, I'm the same way. I can't wait to show it. To, like uh, I'm already talking to John West Lewis about uh, you know showing him our rough rough uh, scenes from uh, from this last episode we shot in uh, Charleston. And uh, I, I got him sending me messages right now about when he can be ready tonight to look at him. I can, I can hardly wait to show it to him. <laughs> That's right. Now, you also had uh, green screen stuff that you had a composite, and especially the, the hangar deck. Uh, now, was that also shot at, at Neutral Zone Studios? No. No, we, the, the green screen is shot at a, uh, a, a, a school up north in Brunswick, I believe. And it's the Sun Coast. Oh, my God, I can't remember that. I can never remember it. But it's a, it's a vocational school for high schoolers to go learn things. And one of the departments is green screen video editing. So I'm sure these people are going to go into, you know, working on the news and working in, in the industry. So 
uh, we had a an extra CC server who plays uh, one of our engineers. He he's a teacher at that school, and he said we have a green screen. And we said, well, great. We'd love to use it. And he goes, well, it's just a great big sheet, you know, that yeah. takes up a wall. And then he goes, but what if we built you a green screen studio? And I go, well, we go, what do you mean? And he goes, no, we've planned on doing the curved walls and the curved everything and painting yeah. the floors. And we said, how much? And then he said, no, 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 no. It's free. You know, come on and use it. So the paint was literally just dried when we got there. We were filming We Are Many. So we were the first boots on the ground on that. Wow. And then we showed them what we did for uh, We Are Many, and they were thrilled. And they said, if you want to come back, and we go, yeah, 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 we do, we do, we do. <laughs> so we, we went back and did it again. And it was just the, the, the best experience. You know, they invite students in to watch and, you know, they're just amazed and they're like in awe and they're like, wow, you know what you're doing. And we go, well, we're just making it up as we go. And, sure, and uh, sure. we know what we're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> So well, I, I I mean, they, they, they did know what they were doing because you had one of those shots was was an overhead looking down. And I was thinking you, you're definitely you've got a floor there. You've got a curved green screen. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, when we did we did the second one. We, we, we benefited from the experience of two DPs, uh, Paul Duncan and Art. Uh, gosh, how do you pronounce Art's last name? Art. Parcells, Parcells, Parcells. Yes, they those guys were amazing, and and uh, and Paul Duncan goes here, and he just cranked up the camera way high. He goes now, now look up as if you're looking at that spacecraft, and you know, unlike my project runabout, when we had we had the visuals for the actress to look at, we don't have anything. We have a blank green screen, so we have to use our imaginations to figure out what we're doing, and Sam can take that and he thought that up we didn't you know we we did do the looking up but he did the way back over the spacecraft and put the spacecraft in the foreground in front of yes. you yes yeah just genius uh, I was, I, that was my next question was to ask you know the compositing you know was that you telling sam what to do or you know sam basically saying i I'll got this don't worry he got it. Uh, yeah we showed we showed him the rough of what we had and Randy and I were really pleased with the rough. You know, Randy did most of the compositing and I did the uh, the modeling for the Soyuz and we were happy with it. But, you know, we, we knew that Sam could, you know, elevate that that six to a 12. And that's what he did. It goes to 12. <laughs> yeah. <There you> go. <laughs> so um, now you said you said Brunswick, by the way, as there are so many states that have a Brunswick when you said up north. Georgia. Are you? What was that? In Georgia. Oh, in Georgia. In Georgia. Oh, okay, in Brunswick, Georgia. The uh, Neutral Zone Studios. It's fantastic. Those people are just so nice. Um, I wasn't there when we did the hangar deck scene this time, but when we did We Are Many, I got to be on the landing party, and, and we were there, and they, they were just so so nice. I, I just oh, that's I yeah, you know, and and, and I have to say again in the the amount of time that i've you know been in you know the world wealth of fan films and you know peripherally in the, in the world of film films there's just there's a lot of really nice helpful people uh oh, definitely. you know especially you know in an education area you know i know that the uh uh the folks in lawrenceville georgia near uh near airy studios were very very happy the school folks were very very happy to be able to use the aries bridge set to teach their students and now Alec is being able to use a green screen from I, I think a local university simple you know similar or maybe it's high school to film the the Axonar green screen stuff and you know just a lot of people just who just want to help you out you know that's uh yes yes I, I totally agree I'm, I'm looking up that 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 school because I I, I, I want to just plug them real quick yeah I'm definitely plug them was. and um uh, I'm running the credits for we are yeah, many. We'll just, we'll just vamp in the meantime. We'll just talk about anything, you know. Like uh, Victoria, I saw a cat earlier on. What's what's the name of your cat? The, <laughs> the green screen. The green screen studio is the gold moon. Okay, sorry. Now you can't talk, Gary, because Victoria's talking about her cat. So, what's the name of your cat? Her name is Moon. 
Moon. Okay, that's a good name for a cat. I like that. <laughs> All right, now you can talk, Gary. You can, you can... Oh, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, okay. so the, the, the green screen was the Golden Isles Career Academy in Brunswick, Georgia. And that was just an amazing place. So the, the administrator of the facility was, was there and the, uh, the teacher that was in charge of the green screen studio. And again, they built that just for us to come. So we, we told them, I said, you need to get on IMDB because you're a shooting location. And yeah. uh, oh, they're just, they're just an amazing group of people, the students, the teachers, the faculty, um, and just, just to welcome these crazy people in Star Trek costumes, just to come on into your, your school and, uh, <laughs> and do this. And, and, you know, and we shot the, uh, the latest one um, right when, you know, COVID, in the middle of COVID. So, you know, we were all masked up and, you know, we had to wait until the students had gone on and gone home, but uh, they just, they didn't even hesitate. Like you said, there are lots of people that were out there who will, they want to help. And, uh, and those people, I, I can't thank them enough because we couldn't have done We Are Many or The More Things Change without that green screen facility. I mean, that overhead shot would, would have been impossible anywhere. It all worked together. I mean, everything about that episode. I mean, I just, I watched one scene after the next, after the next. And, you know, really, I mean, I, I appreciated artistically what you guys did. I appreciated in terms of the story, appreciated the acting. I appreciated the lighting, obviously. I always appreciate the sets. But it was just such a solid Star Trek fan film. So my congratulations to all of you. Gary has something to say. Go ahead. I, I have to gush over that Victoria lady. Because like you said, she had the meat of the dialogue. And my jaw, the, the, we had to edit out the sound of my jaw hitting the ground every time <laughs> that she did a line. The turbo lift scene, that was a long scene. A long a dialogue. dialogue. We did that like in one take. Her and Vlad were just amazing together. I don't think that we had to do a second take. And after they they do this, you know, as producers and directors, Randy and I go, that was perfect. Let's do it one more time. And I don't think we had to do it because I we couldn't have asked for a better performance. Like, so whenever Victoria is on, on, on stage, it's just like, ah, do you do that when you go for your trials? You just know what you're going to say and you do it so well. So I had, I have to gush over Victoria. I, I, I just, I love her to death. Well, well-earned, well-earned Victoria. And once again, you know, applause for a wonderful job in that. Uh, obviously you, you learned all your lines, by the way. Uh, you know, that's <laughs> something that doesn't well, always happen in fan films. The funny part of that is, is, is um, Randy and, and, and Gary, and Randy is mostly the director, um, they are very loose on, um, on performances. You know, they, they want you to bring the performance. And a lot of what you see me do, I ad lib. Um, I, I tend to change lines on the fly because it doesn't sound like something that Dr. Farrell would say and that kind of thing. And, and they give me incredible freedom to do yeah. that. Um, so it helps make her sound authentic. And that's what I want to do. Um, and, and I give Randy the bulk of the credit for that. As long as you hit those main story points, uh, we're, we're happy. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, don't forget the main story points. Uh, <laughs> without those, it makes it very difficult to edit the script. Oh, they should have mentioned this um, it's just so it's so much easier you know when you're trying to uh one of the things you want to do when you're telling a story is is inhabit that character and and what she's feeling and what she's doing when she's relating to someone and uh and you know the worst the most wooden thing in the world is just simply reading rote lines from script you you want to feel it you want to project that emotion and, and, you know, one of the things that, that I teach new attorneys, um, one of the things that I've, I've done for two decades, and I still do it, I write out every question I intend to ask. I never follow the script, <laughs> but I always write it out. And um, typically I'll call my witnesses and I'll tell them, you know, I don't coach my witnesses, but I tell them, this is what I'm going to ask you so you don't get ambushed. 
when you're on the stand. I mean, the worst thing in the world is to, is to get that deer in the headlights. You know, oh my God, you know, why is she asking that? And when you're doing lines on set, it's been my experience that, that it's a lot of the same thing. And, you, you know, you're, you're trying to get forth, you know, when you're performing, you're, you're trying to show what this character is feeling and, and what she's concerned about. Like in, in the turbo lift, Dr. Farrell was just still angry and, and with herself and, and hurt and feeling terrible about the, the Russian who died. And she's relating to her patient and he's asking hard questions and now she's got to tell him, look, dude, you were dead. You weren't just, you know, you were frozen solid, man. You know, and, and she's got to tell him that. You and, were a spacical. <laughs> spacical. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, Randy had it set up in the script the way he wanted it. But, you know, when I'm going through this, I'm, I'm more concerned about conveying you know, the feelings and Randy and, and Gary let you do that, you know, which, which is why when you see those kinds of performances for me that they like so much, um, they give me the room to do that. Not every director does that, that, that I've worked with in the past. And, and I really appreciate that because it makes the character more authentic and believable. And that's really what I want to do because that's what, that's what Trek is. If it doesn't matter what, series it is or or what you know who's creating it if it's telling a good story and and the characters are, are people you care about and relate to that's what in my experience admittedly limited the uh the people who watch those things want to see mm -hmm. that that's that's one of the reasons that, that a lot of the modern shows and i watch them all and i love them all don't get me wrong <laughs> um, you know, Discovery, et cetera, et cetera. I, I watch all of those, and I love Discovery season two. I'm a pilot track girl. I love it. And I thought, I thought that that Anson Mount was just so fantastic. The gal that played Vino was just so fantastic. Oh my god, they were so, they were so great. But um, I felt like that because I care about the characters, and when they make it about how flashy the effects are. And not about whether you care about what this character's feeling. I think that's when a lot of Trek loses the plot. And, and obviously all of us are, are fans. That, that's why we're making this stuff. Yeah. And then I watch Star Trek fan films. And, you know, I actually do many times like the quieter ones when the characters are developed because you know anybody can do a space battle you know i say having you know done a space battle for my own fan film but uh you know to to really have characters you know that's why Vance major who does the the simplest zoom calls uh of star trek fan films that his stuff works because you have these these characters and these interactions and these relationships that once you start watching enough of the the constar you know menard stuff you really start linking to the characters and, and caring about them. I love the good Menard and I hate the evil Menard. And, um, you know, and Vance plays both characters and it's just, it's so, it's so much fun. So, you know, I, I love it. You know, and, and that's, and that's one of the reasons I like Dominion so much is you really, you know, you guys definitely em embrace the quirkiness of your characters. You know, you, you have fun people. You know, I always love seeing John, John Sims as 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 Quincy, you know, and, and his lines, obviously his line at the end of the episode was so was so fun where I won't spoil it if you haven't watched it yet, but uh, kind of you know explains how the cosmonaut may have gotten so far from Earth. Um, <laughs> That's right. At some yeah. point I I want to do a sick face thing with him. Like <laughs> because I'm such a I'm such a nut for the pilots, right? There's that whole scene in where no man has gone before where 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 Dr. Piper is like perfect, perfect. I've never had a patient like you, Gary. <laughs> I want to do that. So, uh, okay, well, write that down, go. Randy. Write that down, Randy. You got to do it for the next. Uh, Even you know, the healthiest ones are generally off on some reading. <laughs> do, do the line the exact way Piper did. Go for it. 
Um, all right. Speaking of the next Dominion uh, episode, what is up next? Have you filmed anything yet or are you still writing stuff? Are you planning <laughs> stuff? Are you in the cats? What are you doing? Go ahead. Well, we, we filmed, we filmed, we're, we're, we filmed uh, uh, a project runabout. So we got half in the can and we have another shoot scheduled here in Ohio in the runabout set in January. And then in February, we'll be down in Kingsland shooting the next Dreadnought Dominion. Uh, so we, our, our schedule is, is, uh, is, is pretty full, but, um, and that's where Randy comes in with his herding of the cats. So <laughs> it all works. <laughs> and actually, I, I had some amazing success in getting actresses up here in Ohio. And I didn't know what I was doing, but Randy suggested that I get on these websites that uh, you just advertise for people who want to do, do, do films. And I go, Randy, who, who's going to want to film in my basement? <laughs> and right, I, right. I put the ad out and I got the, the actress who I, who I picked. She, I put the ad up at like 11 o'clock at night and at eight o'clock in the morning, I had her resume and I couldn't believe it. And I go, okay, I got one. I'm going to choose her. And then I got another and another and another and another. I had a dozen applicants for that one position. So everybody we coming, to, coming over to a stranger's house and going down into his basement. Yes. Yes. Well, yes. Be in my basement, little girl. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> But, you know, I was very, I sent them links to Dreadnought Dominion. I, I, I put our IMDB page and then I, I sent them the costume. I go, because here's the costume, you know, it's a mini skirt. And I go, uh, but my wife, you know, she's going to be there and, you know, and, and she plays in the show. So they were all very comfortable. And I even wrote two, two young ladies who work for me at my, at my work. And they were, they, they, they never even watched Star Trek. And, you know, and they came down in the basement and they watched the entire process with the pilot. But I got two more actresses who are going to be coming to film um, the next uh, the next installment of uh, Project Runabout. And hopefully we're going to hold on to them for characters because the, the young lady who played in my pilot, um, she's a theater actress by trade. And, you know, she came down from Chicago to be in a, a theater production in Columbus, Ohio, and then COVID canceled it. And then her and her, uh, her boyfriend had to get real jobs. <laughs> and so she's now just getting back into that. So she had to leave the series, but uh, we, we loved Vanessa, but I've got more, more people. So I, I was shocked that I was able to get people of the caliber that Randy does. So I don't profess to, to know how he does it, or I just got lucky. <laughs> But if you live in central Ohio and you're an attractive woman, come to Gary's basement. You can wear a Star Trek miniskirt. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh man, it's it's a it, it is it is amazing. And then we we have a little announcement. Uh, Randy thinks I'm crazy, but we're going to launch a a, a second spinoff. Um, and that we're going to second gonna be, spinoff. Yeah, second spinoff. Breaking news, everybody! A That's second right. Dominion That's spinoff. Right. And it will be filming um, probably this time next year uh, that, you know, Joan Savage, who plays our Romulan commander, you know, we've had her in two episodes and she's just an amazing. Oh, yes. By the way, another fantastic name. Yeah. Joan Savage. Oh, what an awesome Savage. name. Ooh. But she, j well, I she think just. John Savage, you know, the, the fellow who yeah. plays uh, Captain Ransom on, uh, on Star Trek Equinox uh, or the Voyager's episode Equinox. Uh, but yeah, so Joan Savage, but Joan just, she just brings it. So when we were doing the live premiere of the more things change and Joan's on, 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 on screen, the, the comments were just going crazy. You know, we want to see Joan. We want to see more Joan. And Joan goes, yeah, me too. So I, I, a little, my, the, the gears in my head were going really warp nine. And the next day I asked Randy, I go, I, I want to do another spinoff and I want to do, I want to do Dreadnought Dominion, but from the vantage point of the Romulans. And I thought that it was assumed that Randy would understand that I want them to be the heroes. And he typed, we, we want to make them the heroes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just let that comment go because I just assumed. And Randy goes, you must hate that idea. And I go, no, it's exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> yes, the, Ro 
This is going to be mind meld. Up. The mind yes. meld between the two we, of you. I, there, we, yeah. we sometimes have the same exact thoughts, thought processes. So we want to do Warbird Valador instead of Dreadnought Dominion. And then it's going to be the crew of this, uh, this Warbird. And we'll have a, we'll have a, a bad guys for them. That uh, and then uh, we'll 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 throw in some Brousseau because you know she comes in and interrupts my adventure, so I have to do the same thing. So I have of to course. go in and interrupt her adventure. But uh, Joan's on board, and 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 uh, she's just she's just another amazing person. And I think I've said this in previous interviews. You know, Joan was a drop in who just happened to show up at one of our filming. And she was an extra. She was just, we just said, here, here, here's a dress. Go put that on. And you're, you're going to be a nurse in the background. And then all of a sudden, she was just doing things like checking the, she did Doc Farrell stuff, where it was like amazing stuff. And so we wanted her to be our regular nurse. And then we were finishing up the shoot. And Randy and I were doing our post, post-shoot uh, talk. Oh, we have to figure out who we want for the Romulan commander. We need to figure this out. And Joan's ear is just, you need a Romulan? I do Romulan cosplay. <laughs> so we had her back for the, the, uh, the, that, that shot on Red, the Redemption at Red Medusa to do the Romulan bridge. And then we had another drop in. Uh, Thomas Dye just showed up, you know, out of the blue because we put these announcements out if you want to come in and be an extra just show up and and thomas die shows up and he goes i do a romulan helmet <laughs> and romulan costumes so he he does all the romulan stuff so th- that's why i think this the second spinoff is just it's faded because these two people were just random drop-ins and they're they're so romulan centered that I, I think we owe it to them to give them the center stage. And oh, absolutely. I, are you going to build a, a, a set for them specifically, or are you going to do the well, green screen and put stuff around them or what? We've done so well with Kingsland and we're just going to do this a la enterprise incident because when they filmed the enterprise incident, they just redressed those sets. It's, yeah. it's lighting, pr- lots of purple, lots of green, and then add-ons to the, the the set, and then you know the Romulan commander's quarters were drapes and just add-ons. And you know, I looked for her chair that the Romulan commander had in Enterprise. And I found it. It's ten thousand dollars. I don't <laughs> think I could. I don't think I can afford that. Crowdfunder. <laughs> for ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars for a chair. Chair. <laughs> Is it Kirk's so, chair? No, it's just a nice office chair. It's just, it's <laughs> a weird chair. But no, we're just gonna dress up uh, auxiliary control because that is a great space. And you don't see it, but there's another area that used to be the bar that we used for um, our first episode. So oh, no. my plan is to... what's that? Anchors away. Anchors, Anchors away. away. Yeah, we had a bar. bar. Yeah, and exactly we're just gonna use that set for her for her cabin. And then we're just going to redress those corridors. And again, Thomas Dye, he, he goes, yeah, I've got it. I, I'm going to build things to put on the, the sides of the door, you know, do the, the TOS Romulan logo. Uh, I've got black helmets. Uh, we're going to have ground troops. We're going to shoot on location in Florida and have a, I, sh- I should shut up because I'm really seeing too much. <laughs> I wasn't going to stop you, uh, but, but I'm no, just, this is I just really popular too, because it seems like the, the fans love that stuff. When Randy Landers did uh, the Klingon spinoff, oh my God, it was yeah, more popular than Cruiser anything else. It's Kapoor. like a mirror universe. Everyone for some reason loves that too. Yes, yeah. You know yes. what? Cause we don't, we, we, we always see, you know, Starfleet stuff. We love Star, we love, we love Star Trek or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's really interesting. You know, even Star Trek has never really done this before. I mean, the closest we've gotten were like episodes like Face of the Enemy, where Troy is on a Romulan warbird. But I found that really, really fascinating. You know, and of course, you know, the, the, the original one of that when Riker is on a, a Klingon bird of prey in the, in the second season, that was also a fun one. By the way, you know, that episode uh, where uh, 
where Riker is, is you know, there's the, there's the exchange program. And so Riker goes to a Klingon ship. And then the Benzite goes to the Enterprise, right? Okay. So where does the Klingon go? He goes to the Benzite ship. <laughs> Can you imagine the torture there? I mean, he's getting off the transporter and they're offering him a complimentary mint. And <laughs> just... <laughs> you know, and he wants to go and, you know, and bash somebody like, oh, you know, well, yeah, we don't do that. We're just all, you know, science all the time. Um, you know, we tell That's jokes, right. we do a little karaoke. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, they, those two weeks probably were the hellish, the most hellish for the clean. <laughs> oh, anyway. All right. Well, you know what? I think we, uh, we, we've gone, I don't even know if it's overtime or not. I've lost count, but uh, I want to just, you know, thank all of you for, you know, for your time tonight and, and also for just a, really spectacular fan series and obviously a new fan series coming out too. I can't wait to see. So when do you think we'll have another dominion or are you just going to be too busy, you know, doing the, uh, no, the we're, runabout? We're going to film Randy's uh, latest script. Like R- R- Randy has dreadnought dominion episodes mapped out for the next decade. So, okay. he's, <laughs> so he's got, a, a, and by the way, when he pitches these ideas, it's just like, yeah, I, I I have an idea for a, a planet that's actually a, a person eating monster, and I go okay, whatever. But, but then when I read it, uh, and then Prodigy did that last week. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But his, his, so, yeah. you did it first. You did it. That's right. We did it first. first. Yeah. Okay. But his. Uh. his his episodes just just knock my socks off. So when he when he gives me these outlandish, oh by the way, we're gonna pick up a, a Soviet cosmonaut. Okay, Randy. And then <laughs> and then we're gonna get kidnapped by some teenagers. Okay, Randy. So I I don't judge anything he says because when he gives me the final script, I'm like, I'm doing one of these again. It's 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 amazing. So yeah, we're gonna shoot his latest uh, script in, in in February. And I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Really looking forward to it. Okay, and that's been fun to shoot his stories. And I always get plenty of notice so I can block my calendar and be there. And I really appreciate that. That's that's fantastic. So if you film it in February, just to give, and then we'll end it up uh, after this. But you know, if you film it in February, just to give people an idea of you know how long this post production lasts. How long do you think until it'll debut? Well, the last time we filled in February and we released in November. So I think that was the longest that we've gone. Um, well, the other episode, it only took, uh, what, two months, three months? Yeah, we're, we're pretty quick. You know, uh, the, 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 the project runabout went warp speed. Yeah. And uh, then we filmed Supposed the first to. part of, of pro- the s- second project run about just last month. And we'll, but we're not filming again till, till January. So that won't be released until March or April. So it's just subjective to how many shots that we have, but the February episode just, it all depends on the CTI. <laughs> and then, but Randy's a master at laying out. I don't even know how he does it. I mean, Picking the shot is like that we do laying in there is like picking your favorite child to which one you're going to feed. <laughs> and I don't know how he does it. And I don't get involved in that. And I don't question hardly anything because what he does is just masterful. And uh, I, I, I can't, I can't say enough about my production partner. Can't do it without Randy. Well, I am glad for all of you. I'm thankful for all of you because by the time this comes up, it'll almost be Thanksgiving. So, you know, I am thankful for fan filmmakers such as yourselves because, you know, you entertain me, you entertain us and you do it well. So anyway, once again, all three of you, Gary, Randy, Victoria, thank you for your time. Thank you for your fan film. And uh, I guess I'm starting to do this right now and and with the uh, live long and prosper. So uh, if you want to give me a good salute there. All righty. Take care, guys. Make more fan films. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you for having us.